Hello everyone, and welcome to my talk on mimetics, or the study of mimetics. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the theory of memes. What are they? What do they do to us? And why are we so obsessed with them? We'll start with a little bit of history. The word meme was first coined by the scientist Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene. When he used this word, he used it to refer to a little piece of culture, maybe an idea, maybe a figure of speech, that gets replicated and passed on to other people. Now, I like, this, well, I like this idea a lot, but in this talk, we're going to consider a kind of different aspect of memes. We're going to think of memes as mind viruses. So, the cool thing about thinking of memes this way is that it gives you a lot of um, ways of like, kind of understanding what they are and how they work. Right? So, we're going to be using this metaphor a lot throughout this talk. Let's start first by considering the question of why memes are a thing. Why do we care so much about memes? Why do they obsess us? Why is internet culture so prevalent with the idea of memes? The answer to that is actually obtained by turning that question around. Why are memes obsessed with us? And that is actually a simple question to answer. Memes need us. The whole point of a meme is it's some kind of information that replicates by getting other people to share it, by getting humans to spread it. And in that way, the metaphor of a meme as a virus is particularly apt. So it comes down to basically the reason why memes are so good at getting us interested in them is because they have to be. If a meme wants to spread, it must be good at getting people to care about it and getting people to share it. We'll now talk about the life cycle of a meme. And to do this, I'm going to use a case study, Chemistry Cat. So this was a common internet meme, um, quite a while ago actually, of a cat picture of a cat in a chemistry lab with bunches of test tubes and all kinds of chemical equipment next to it. Um, and you combine this with a common chemistry joke that was usually used in like K-12 science education. Together, when you add these two separate memes together, you get a combined meme that has a much larger power and a much better ability to get people to care about it and spread it. In a way, you can think of this as how when you take two viruses and you recombine them, you can sometimes get a more powerful virus, a superbug, that can spread at astounding speeds and cause massive epidemics. The next step in the meme life cycle is transmission. When the meme gets on some kind of social networking site, or maybe just through word of mouth, and spreads itself, makes many, many, many copies of itself as people look at the meme, think about the meme, and now suddenly the meme is in their brain. They're thinking about it and they can spread it to other people. Of course, that's not all that memes do. They also undergo the process of mutation, where they change their form in some relatively simple way to make another meme that is potentially more effective. So in this case, we can have internet memes that simply just change the joke or you could go completely past that and actually make another meme that essentially copies the format but has a different image and a different joke. Of course, there's a limited amount of memes that we can think about. There's a limited amount of space in your brain to, for you to remember things and spread things. That's why we have the process of selection as well, where you have different memes competing for the same spot, the same information spot in your brain um, and eventually what you'll have is that one or the other wins out and gets a much more pervasive influence. Now that we've kind of gone through the life cycle of a meme, we're going to move into some examples of uh, from real life. Trends that happen in real life and kind of trace them and understand how they work. One of our best tools for this um, technique is to use Google Trends. Google Trends provides basically search volumes for any, any term that you care to search up. In this case, I used the relatively old meme, YOLO. What you can see here is that the meme undergoes a pretty like typical life cycle. At first, you have a little bit of steady, slow influence, but then suddenly you get exponential growth as it catches and people begin to think, oh, that's so cool, let me say that too. You have increasing search results for this meme, and um, the influence of the meme increases and increases and increases. But at some point, people don't think of it as, don't think it's that funny anymore. And then you get a slow, steady decline over time. 
So this is the basic curve that we want to see when we look at a name. The cool thing here is we can use our metaphor of memes as viruses and better understand how this works. So here I have, next to the graph from the last slide, a picture of a cholera outbreak. So in, in many ways, you can see that these graphs are almost identical. It's amazing how similar they are. You can see the same kind of start of low activity, sudden exponential growth, and then the slow decay over time. What this kind of shows us is that memes are very much spread in a similar fashion to viruses, to diseases. We'll move on to a more complicated meme life cycle. This is the, meme, the search results for 2048, a popular internet game where you just slide box, uh, blocks onto each other until you give up at some point. What we see here is mostly a typical graph. You see the initial uprise exponential growth and then a slow decay over time. However, note that the activity actually continues and in fact, it oscillates cyclically. If you look at the times when it's lowest, it's during the summer when people are presumably outside and do not have time for internet games. It peaks in the winter when people are indoors and uh, have a higher chance of wanting to play some kind of internet game. The cool thing is, let's think about the flu virus. The flu virus follows almost exactly the same pattern. You have the cyclical seasonal pattern of the flu virus increasing in incidence during the winter and going down during the summer. Now we have another example. This is of the use of the meme small. So what we can see here is probably the clearest example of selection um, having an effect on meme um, currencies. So we see that small with one L is clearly winning out. It, they both rise initially, but over time people start adopting only small with one L, and small with two Ls just kind of fades away into non-existence. In fact, that's not the full story. The graph that I showed you previously was the graph that only worked for the United States. This is the worldwide instance of these two words. What we see in this case is that these kind of memes can be limited geographically. So maybe in the US, small with one L won out. But in other countries, for example in Italy, small with two Ls actually wins out in this, in this kind of regional battle. Um, in a way, this is a lot like how diseases um, separate themselves into two different geographic areas. So, for example, during the Colombian Exchange, um, a lot of diseases, such as smallpox, from the old world were not present in the new world. And that's kind of the same idea here. You have memes from one place that kind of co coexist with memes from another place, and both are dominant in their own regions. Now we'll move to an example that's a little bit more relevant to us Rice students. Just a few weeks ago, we had an interesting instance of a meme that actually took over and went amok in our community. So in our group meme, we have um, the ability to change our nicknames. And essentially what happened is that these three individuals decided to replace their name with a nickname that had some vegetable and then their name after it with some kind of alliteration. So, Immediately after this, you see a great growth in people following this trend and continuing to and coming up with their own like produce-related names. Um, what's particularly interesting here is we can actually kind of look at the um, transition pattern and understand better the kind of community that um, our college has. So what we see is that instead of the typical exponential growth, which is the common meme life cycle, we see something that looks more or less linear which means that the whole group just effectively, one after the other, fell like dominoes and succumbed to the meme. In a way, this is a good way to understand how the Lovett community works. It seems that we have an extremely close-knit group that works together really well, and that's why you see such coherent results. Of course, that's not to say that everyone followed the meme format exactly. There were several mutations, people who changed it to something that kind of fed up, fell outside of the frame. But at the same, so in, in a sense, this shows that you can still have mutations in the overall general pattern. With that, I'd like to thank you all for coming to my TED Talk.